let's talk about my second favorite topic of all time besides food science, thermodynamics. And what we're going to examine right now is the thermodynamics of how ice is formed and how it stays frozen and how it melts and some of the things that impact that, um, including the addition of sugar. So let's start by taking a look at what's in the freezer, which is my thermometer. And I want you to see, well, it's going up pretty fast, but originally we were at around four Fahrenheit. Now you probably know freezing is 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees C. So why the heck should the freezer be so cold? Doesn't that constitute some sort of inefficiency? Well, turns out we need it to be that cold because while 32 degrees is freezing, it isn't actually when anything would freeze, practically speaking. So we should think about what uh, the different forms of matter are and how they're different from each other. So going back to uh, some basics here, uh, matter can be in the form of a gas or vapor. Uh, matter can be in the form of a liquid, which I'm drawing as a puddle. Um, or matter can be in the form of a solid. And so when we say something is frozen, we are not necessarily talking about Disney princesses. We're talking about matter that's in this solid form. Now let's zoom in and refresh on what the molecules are doing here so we could get a better picture. So here's our magnifying glass. And what do we see? In a gas, we have molecules that are very widely spaced from each other and moving very rapidly, okay? And by the way, star of simplification, we are uh, skipping to the, the uh, simple version of all of this. That's, that's pretty effective. Um, liquid, what do we have? We have the molecules closer in general. Okay, so they, these molecules that were a gas pretty much don't interact. These molecules that are a liquid are interacting somewhat. And uh, they are, but they're not all at absolutely fixed distances from each other. And uh, they are moving, uh, but they are moving, they have less clear travel paths than for the gas. So they, they don't tend to get as far before they bump into something else. And then solid, Solid comes in a couple of flavors, and I'll just show one of them here. Solid may, in fact, have everything on a nice little three-dimensional grid formation that's going on. But the molecules are in uh, a bit of a lattice, and they move, but they move pretty darn slowly. Mostly they move by jiggling. They can kind of diffuse throughout this matrix but uh, it takes a while. It is not a rapid thing like it would be in a gas. And uh, when they are in this sort of matrix, that's called a crystal. And when they are in less of a completely orderly form, but still uh, close together and behaving uh, like a solid, that may be what we call amorphous. And uh, you've seen that ice, water uh, can make crystals, and um, you've also experienced kind of amorphous. And in fact, there is a middle space where there's, uh, it's very tricky to have, for example, a sink in ice cube that is just one crystal. Usually if uh, it's, a, it's a bunch of them all kind of bumped up against each other, and so, you have crystalline regions that are all lined up together, and then you might have kind of amorphous reason, regions where um, things are uh, not quite as organized. And this over here, as you may recall from uh, thinking about chocolate, something that is amorphous is less stable than something that's in its crystal form where everything is nice and organized and clicked into its proper spot. And so a thing 
that uh, is key here is that as you transition, if you have some material that's a gas, so say we have water and the water is a vapor and it condenses to become a liquid and then uh, it freezes into ice, um, you, have, you have to remove energy from the system. And that happens here too. Or if you're going the other way, you have to add energy. Okay, so it works both directions. Okay, so there is an energy change. And a thing about this that's neat, so the energy that is moving when you go from gas to liquid is called delta H of vaporization. And the energy that you have when you go from liquid to solid is delta H of fusion. And in, in the case of traveling from left to right here, we have to remove that energy. And in the case from traveling from solid all the way up to gas, you have to add that energy. This has a really important implication that I got to draw a graph for. So here I have on the y-axis temperature, and uh, we're going to pretend we're using absolute temperature here, so there's no negative temperatures. And then on the x-axis, we have how much energy is being removed. So let's say we uh, have a water vapor that we stick into a freezer, and uh, the freezer is removing kind of the same amount of energy every five minutes as this goes on. So this would be a graph of the temperature over time. So we stick this stuff in at, say, room temperature. So it starts up here, this gas, and its temperature goes down until it hits the temperature at which water condenses. What's that temperature? Anyone remember? Oh, yeah. Okay, so 100 Celsius. It'll hit 100 Celsius, and then what's going to happen on this graph? Here's the, here's the funky part. It's going to go flat. You're like, what? This flat part is where the energy is being removed. That has to do with this phase change. So this, how much energy that is, is the same as delta H VAP. Um, and so that we've got that energy change there, but there's no temperature change. So it stays at 100 this whole time as the system is going from uh, liquid to, um, from vapor to liquid. Okay, then after it is 100% liquid, so up here is vapor, now we are all liquid. And then from this point, it continues cooling um, and it'll have a different slope because the heat capacity is different. Um, actually, I think I should have made that steeper, a steeper slope because higher heat capacity uh, or lower heat capacity. Mm, I'm going to have to double check. Anyway, so here it is. It's liquid. It is cooling down. And again, we get to the point where now we're at zero degrees Celsius. And again, it'll go flat for a bit. And this flat bit corresponds to delta H of fusion coming out of the system. And then it'll cool once again as it's ice, as it's a solid. So what is it when you add something like sugar or salt to uh, ice as you are trying to make that form? And uh, on one hand, this is an answer you probably know already. But on the other, uh, let's make sure we've done the appropriate math for it. And then Add ice to an insulated cup. And let's imagine we have an old-fashioned ice cream machine here. So, the thermometer that we are, oh look, we are in Celsius. Okay, let's hang out in Celsius, that's fine. So, this is showing There we go, zero degrees Celsius, about what we expected. Now, if you've ever seen someone use an old fashioned ice cream machine, you know that they'd have ice packed around the machine, and then they would add salt, perhaps kosher salt, some sort of nice chunky salt that it's cheap to get a whole bunch of. Whoops, 
helps if you don't turn off the thermometer while you're working with this. And you will notice, looking close, that the temperature actually dropped. We're now below zero. Went up a bit. Let me, there we go, negative three. Um, and in fact, you'll see something fun happen if I switch us over to Fahrenheit. Assuming I can get us switched over to Fahrenheit in a sensible and rapid manner. Nope, just not listening to me. There we go. Fahrenheit? Nope. Well, one of the reasons that zero Fahrenheit isn't freezing is they, uh, Professor Fahrenheit set the lowest temperature on his thermometer to be the lowest temperature he could get in lab, which was the temperature he could obtain by salting ice. So, what's happening when we have salt plus uh, ice reaching a lower temperature than ice was? Well, a good mental model for this is for you to imagine things as crystals. Now, star of simplification many times because uh, this, well, this is a greater or lesser issue when you have more or less degree of crystallinity. But let's pretend for a moment we're just thinking about crystals and you have water as this nice crystal lattice. You add something that dissolves well into the water and what happens? It disrupts that lattice, right? Do you see we've got this blue lump in the middle and we now can't make our nice little uh, squares anymore. And we know that this, uh, this blue lump is kind of attracted to the water, so it wants to stay, uh, but we're at zero degrees, so the water wants to push this blue lump out. And uh, what it means is uh, now at that temperature of zero degrees, we're back being a liquid again because uh, the crystal simply can't form around this lump. So how, how do we get rid of that lump? Well, we drop the temperature even further. So lower, lower that temperature and remove more energy. So delta, I'm gonna write it as energy. We take some more energy out and eventually we will have taken enough energy out that either we can semi-crystallize, we can um, crystallize as we did and push the blue lump kind of to the outside edge. So that is a thing that can happen. Uh, and in fact, uh, this is how they purify pharmaceuticals. They get pure chemicals crystallized and leave a whole bunch of other stuff in the liquid, which includes all of your solutes that you really don't want to have anything to do with. So that's an or. Um, or you uh, take it further in terms of crystallization. You drop the temperature still lower and you get the water to be crystals and whatever your little blue lumps are kind of get trapped between different crystals. And it means, tends to make our crystals relatively smaller with more disruptions in them. And so those of you who were wondering about texture, uh, this up here, right? So let's think about this in terms of food. Our pure water crystal uh, will tend to have the hardness of pure water if we've crystallized it nicely as a single crystal. Uh, it'll have, um, it'll be really tough on the teeth, okay? Um, and it'll be kind of nice looking. Whereas when we have this situation over here, those micro breaks introduced by the solutes, in fact, make a difference. Um, and when you think about uh, kind of what's going on with, say, ice cream, uh, you actually have ice crystals that are there that are pure water ice, and then the stuff that is your kind of ice cream flavor and fats stay as, uh, well, maybe not so much the fats, but certainly uh, some of the sugar, water, and proteins stay kind of in the liquid phase um, and surround those ice crystals, giving it that nice 
creamy consistency. So the more stuff uh, you add, the lower the temperature you need to get to in order to create a salad. And even then, you tend to have either um, some small pockets of liquid or disruptions in your crystal structure, such that the more other stuff you add, even when you make it solid, it's never quite as hard a solid um, with as large crystals as you might have had if you had no solutes at all. So this whole phenomenon uh, is considered under the, the heading of colligative property, which is uh, it has more to do with how many moles of a chemical you add to the water and less to do with what exactly that chemical is, believe it or not. And this is an approximation. This is, of course, which chemical you're working with makes a difference. But uh, at the concentrations we're talking about, not so much. So let's think about this again in terms of water activity, because water activity is part of what's going on here. In this cup up here, I have maybe um, maybe 180 grams of water, which is about 10 moles. And then when I added salt, I probably threw in a few fingerfuls you saw. So let's say that was about five, maybe six grams of salt. So that's about um, 0.1 mole. And so if we work out the water activity in this case, and you saw how the, the temperature was dropping, it's still in, oh, wait, one thing you got to remember, a thing that's special about salt. One mole of NaCl, when it gets dissolved in water, gets you two moles of particles because it becomes Na plus and Cl minus. So that's around 0.2 moles. And that still means our water activity is in the um, 0.9, oh, eight range. So it's very, very high. So if we were to graph this on like a, some kind of TXY diagram, you, we would still be um, right here next to the axis. It's so close to being pure from this standpoint. And yet we are able to make a big change in the temperature. Uh, and that's because it's, uh, again, we need to get up to much higher mole fractions before it really, really starts to matter uh, the nana idealities of the particular chemical. Uh, whereas here, so we're just talking about this. So you could also, uh, so this is why you sprinkle salt on the sidewalk. This is also why it's gonna be hard to make uh, a electrolyte slushy uh, because it drives the freezing point way down. Um, you don't have to add much to get a big change in freezing point. Uh, also, you could do this with sugar. You could do this with anything else soluble in water. Uh, this works any soluble compound. Uh, the thing is, remember, sugar has a pretty high molecular weight. So uh, salt uh, is about uh, not quite 60 grams per mole. And sugar, depending on which sugar you're using, say you're gonna use glucose, um, that'll be 180 grams per mole. Uh, and so if you try and do this with sugar, you gotta add a whole lot more to change the uh, freezing point by quite as much as you can change it for a little bit with the salt.